Hey, Grow Wire listeners, thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Grow Wire podcast. I'm your host, Fritz Nelson, and I'm joined by Kendall Fisher, producer and host of the Grow Wire show. Hey. On this episode, we're joined by someone much smarter than me, my Agreed. friend. <laughs> <laughs> nice. My friend. I know now you're going to say you have a friend. <laughs> exactly. He's been my friend for over three decades, the brilliant NASA engineer Don Cornwell. We'll be diving into all things space and science, including Don's current role overseeing communications and navigations development work at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. And that includes inventing things and flying things into space. I probably should have mentioned he's a lot cooler than me, too. Also agreed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm done. I'm done. Uh, yeah, no, you're not. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to take a deep dive into his previous work at NASA, including lunar laser communication technology and how it's transforming to bring major benefits to the world. But before we get into that, I let Don take us through his personal journey of growth from his childhood dreams of becoming an astronaut to our days together at the University of Maryland, Go Terps to an internship that would eventually, with a few detours along the way, lead to Don joining NASA's leadership team. You won't want to miss this episode. Coming up next. You're listening to the Grow Wire podcast, a place where you will learn the ins and outs of growing a business, running a business, or even taking your big idea, career, or personal development to the next level. It's all possible. Our host, Fritz Nelson, the editor-in-chief of GrowWire.com, will take you on an exploration of growth through candid conversations with some of the most brilliant minds in entrepreneurship, entertainment, business development, and more. Whatever your goal, we know you'll walk away with the right tools to help fuel your journey of growth. Before we get into this episode with Don, a message from our sponsors over at Blue Mike's. Everyone has a story to tell, and if you're a storyteller, you probably know Blue Mics for their iconic Yeti microphone, which has helped millions of people find and amplify their voices. If you're thinking about creating your own podcast, maybe doing it from space, right, Kendall? Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Recording some voiceovers, gaming, reading audiobooks, or whatever you have, then you need to check out Blue's new Yeti caster. It's the complete mic and boom arm system, ready to to connect to your laptop, bringing the ultimate broadcast studio setup to your home or office or outer space. Or spaceship. Or spaceship. Maybe that's what, you know, Don talks about we're doing more on the moon this time, just so you guys know. And maybe he means a podcast recording with blue mics. Mm. I would like to do the first podcast from outer space. We need to talk to Don about this. Yeah. All right. Okay, we'll we'll do it after there. there. Okay, okay. Well, anyway, Blue's Yeti Caster is what we use here at the Grow Wire Santa Monica Studios, and we really do enjoy recording with them. To get your hands on one of these setups, visit bluedesigns.com and use the code PODCAST at checkout for a special price. We also want to make sure you head over to our website, growwire.com. That's G-R-O-W-W-I-R-E.com to check out more intriguing stories just like this one across a variety of topics. For example, check out our How I Grew It section for our story on White Labs to find out how a biochemist took his passion for brewing beers at home and turned it into a successful pure yeast and fermentation company. Or the story of a family who fled Vietnam and completely transformed a neighborhood bakery into a leading manufacturer of baked goods. This is all making me very hungry. That's ready for your reading right now on GrowWire.com. So I should probably start by telling listeners that we have been friends for three plus decades. Yes. We went to college together, University of Maryland. We were roommates for a short time. For a summer, I lived in the closet, yes. That's right, the closet of our massive apartment in Maryland. It was a massive closet. And and I just, I wanna just make sure I'm recalling this correctly, but it could just be this sort of fantasy in my head that we used to go around, a bunch of us guys, and serenade 
the women at the girls' dorms and sororities. Yeah, yeah. It was like a combination of trick-or-treat and Christmas caroling. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think the, the, the girls might have thought it was more of a trick than a treat. Yeah, it was definitely invoking Halloween, no doubt. Yeah. When a couple of the people could sing, and we had a good time. As I recall, late at night um, with our special brand of harmony. That's right. So, yeah, so we go back a long way, but we're going to go back to your early days in a minute. But I want to start kind of at the end and have you tell us in your own words, what do you do? Okay, so I work at NASA. I work at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. specifically. I'm responsible for all the communications and navigation uh, development work at the agency. So what is de- like development work? What does that mean? That means developing new technologies, demonstrating new technologies. So it's more than just laboratory type work. Uh, my group uh, basically gets uh, funded and executes uh, demonstration flight projects. So we fly things in space. We invent things, but then we fly them to prove that they work with the idea that hopefully uh, an operational system comes behind us. And so I thought NASA headquarters was in Goddard at no, this is in Washington, D.C. Downtown, okay. Three blocks from the uh, Capitol. Gotcha, okay. You gotta stay close to the, you know, the funding I, source. I, I, I haven't been <clears throat> to uh, D.C. in that kind of capacity in a long time, so I forget where everything is. So we're gonna come back to some of that and what that means and okay. some of the things you're doing because I find it fascinating. And I think, actually, do you know, maybe you don't even know this about me. When I graduated from college, I moved to Huntsville, Alabama, and I worked for a contractor for NASA at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. How about that? And we worked on the space shuttle program. Wow. My father was head of electrical engineering for a company that made all of the non-motor parts for the solid rocket booster. So Morton Thaikal was the motor, and we were the rest of it. And so I got a good taste of, um, now I wasn't a scientist, mind you, I was a technical writer, and okay. we wrote up some of the change proposals that went to NASA for approval before we made any of the changes on the, uh, on the booster rockets. Oh, that's so important. So yeah. important, right? I mean, you've, you've got to know what, uh, what you're going to change and uh, document it and get it approved. Well, it was amazing to me because, <laughs> you know, I didn't know anything coming into that, and The fact that every single change, whether big or small, had to go through a whole review process. It had to be documented, had to be reviewed. There were meetings to review it, cost assessments and all that. And you wonder why things cost so much money on the space shuttle. It's because it takes a lot of people's time and energy. It might be a screw, but it costs $300 worth of people's time and energy to, to change it. That's right. That's right. And that's why it takes so long to get things done as well. Right. So, you know, that uh, I'm not sure if you've talked to anyone from New Space, but there's, uh, you know, like SpaceX is New Space. And they've they've come in kind of with a different philosophy about things. I mean, I'm, I'm still very supportive of the NASA philosophy, but I guess they can take risks. You know, it's not it's not taking shortcuts. I think what happens is when you've been in the business for a very long time, you build up a sort of a legacy of, of boxes that you need to check so to speak. And I think that when you come in as, with a clean slate as a new company, you, you haven't had a chance to build up a lot of these uh, legacy boxes that may be overcome by events. We've tried to bring that into the part of the program at NASA that, that we have right now that, that I'm running. And that is uh, a philosophy against what I call checkbox engineering, meaning, you know, you're engineers, you're, you're smart people, you've been educated, you know, by, by, by our system. Take every one of these requirements and look at it and and see if it's actually still a valid thing or is this something left over from 1968 or something like that that doesn't matter anymore. And, you know, I've got a friend who's an astronaut who has a a bunch of stories like that. And they're all good stories because we do persevere through it. But it's you have to be cognizant of of what you're deciding to do and and not do so that it's, you know, you make decided risks. Right. Yeah. Uh, We're going to we're going to go back to that topic and we talk a little bit about some of these these new companies uh, getting involved too, because that is a fascinating topic. But I want to go back to your childhood. <laughs> you don't have to cry. But like, what, what, what was your childhood like? Like, I, I mean, I knew you 
as a, as as a college kid, and I never heard you talk about science or space or anything like that. But were there things in your childhood that you would say, in some way, led you down this path? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I was an only child. I was always a good student, and in elementary school, I had a sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Shar, who had a, a planetarium dome inside her classroom. And this is, again, early 19, eh, mid-1970s, something like that. I can't remember what sixth grade is for us. But anyway, and she had a little projector, and she would project, you know, turn all the lights off and project the stars up on the ceiling. And somehow she was able to maintain control of the classroom with all the lights off for sixth graders. I'm impressed. But she was good. She was good. So after that, I was uh, really excited about space. And my parents bought me a little telescope. And I went out and, you know, found all the planets and, and found all these other little things in the sky, like, you know, little nebula clouds and galaxies and all the things you can find as a 12 year old and after that i was hooked i did a bunch of science fairs i did well in those Uh, i went to eleanor roosevelt got a lot of math and science which was more of that and i also did internships in the summer so when i was 16 i got an internship at nasa goddard space flight center in greenbelt maryland and by the way i can't recommend recommend it highly enough to if, if you have children or grandchildren or friends that have teenagers and they have any kind of interest in this, NASA has wonderful programs for that. It's actually uh, intern.nasa.gov. Now, right now, we're swamp full of interns. Of In my program, I think we have 43 interns right now. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And we have high school interns. We have, of course, college interns, and we also have some graduate students as well. But the selection process is usually in the January, February time frame. So if you have interest next year, you know, look for that. That's my public service announcement. I like it. I for like the day it. here. I might apply. <laughs> um, <laughs> is there an age limit? So you are always interested, and your parents encouraged you. Oh, very much. Yeah, very much. You know, they might. So this is one of my great stories from my dad, who unfortunately passed about six months ago. But uh, he had no interest in any of this stuff. But he was such a great dad. He would drive me down into D.C. where they would have these uh, monthly astronomy talks at the uh, the National Aquarium. He used to be in D.C. before they moved it to Baltimore. And my dad would crash out. You know, he'd be over there just completely uh, sawing logs, and I'd be the nerd kid listening to this lecture. And <laughs> I'd look, he was just great. He was, he was fantastic for that. And I, I still, uh, it's one of my best memories of my, my dad. He was so. a little nerdy, too, if I recall. I in mean, in way. different ways. I mean, we. I remember one summer installing air conditioners with with you and him. Yes, you did. That's <laughs> right. That's a right. Fiber in my lungs from that experience. Probably <laughs> it's a still. little fiberglass. It's good for you, right? <laughs> yeah. Fiber's good. Yeah, <laughs> it builds up the immune system. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know what it builds up, but. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, so my dad was a heating and uh, an air conditioning uh, technician, and uh, on the side, he uh, would, would do installations, and he'd pay us. We had good money, too, but, yeah. you know, we had to crawl under houses and oh, drag duck work, and, yeah. I thought we saw a few snakes back in those days, too. Yeah. So what, what, what did you, like, did you envision being in the space industry in general as a kid? Like, what did you want to be? When you grow up. So at that point, I wanted to be an astronaut, right? I wanted to be an astronaut and a U.S. senator. That was kind of my, my thing. The John Glenn role. Right? Yeah. And then at some point, I realized I wasn't very good with roller coasters. And so <laughs> I, I think that kind of ruled out the space thing a little bit. Uh, but, you know, I, I pursued through the engineering side of things and uh, got a co-op position uh, when I was uh, at, at Maryland in the uh, electrical engineering department, right? I was a student there and continued to work at Goddard. So it was a great it was kind of a great background to get. I wonder if I fulfilled that 2,000-hour thing that, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about in Outliers, right? Everyone has to – maybe it was 10,000 hours. I don't know what it is. But, you know, he, he made this story that the reason the Beatles were so were so huge is because they played all these uh, shows in Hamburg every night for, like, eight hours. And after a couple of years, they, you know – anyway, I'm, hopefully they I'm not good. off topic. No, they got good. They got good, exactly. Yeah. Couldn't help. But, you so why University of Maryland? I mean, I know why I went there, but <laughs> but I wasn't a scientist. <laughs> I went there because it had a good uh, department, and I could afford to go at the time. Gotcha. But then you you ended up getting a, a not just a bachelor's, but a master's and a PhD. Why didn't you go somewhere else? Uh, because uh, I was in something called the part time graduate study program that NASA had. Here's another public service announcement coming up. All right. So <laughs> I like how you pre announce those. Those are good. <laughs> if, if if you work for the federal government and and you're doing well there, then they will offer you uh, potentially to to get a graduate degree uh, part time. And so I got to a couple of days off a week to to go to classes, 
And then, you know, I worked in between and did my homework at night. And afterwards, I had to repay them a certain amount of time for the time that I was in school. I think it was like three to one, something like that. But uh, that's that's so you pay them in time. Yeah, you work off your time, so to speak. It's like being in a school jail. Yeah, indentured servitude. Yeah, right? yeah, smart. Those yeah. NASA guys are smart. Yeah. Yeah, so you, so I mean, so all that time we were in college and doing the things that we did, which we won't talk about here, other than the serenading thing, you were also actually working at NASA. Part-time, although I'll tell you, there was a period in college where, you know, I just kind of had poor grades and it wasn't doing too well and it didn't look good and I was even registered as a business major for a while uh, for one <laughs> semester. <laughs> and then somehow I got my act together around uh, junior year. I guess I've matured. What is it they say that uh, male brains don't fully form until you're like 24 or something like that? So Oh, so I'm done? Uh, it's over for us, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you learn there? What did you accomplish? I mean, I had you did like a, your PhD on wind LIDAR. Yeah. So it was the best part of the job because it was so hands-on, right? I mean, part of it part of it was, you know, learning hands-on technology, but the other part was learning how to navigate the system. So back then, if you needed to buy something, like I was the gopher guy, I could like I was the master of running it through the system, meaning walking a procurement document to different people's desks and basically hounding them until they signed it right in front of me and, you know, and then you get your stuff bought, you know, right? Then you all of a sudden you're, you know, you you got your toys. I got my toys, exactly. So that's and that's that's as much a part of the process as as doing something technical as actually being able to turn the crank and get it out of the system. So what was your first project there? Funny enough, it was actually doing free space laser com, which is kind of you know where I've wound up right now. But it's one of these things where it's a good idea every ten years, and then it like gets killed and goes away for ten years, and then it comes back out. So I think we're finally getting over threshold with it. And let me say, by the way, that I've not spent my entire career at NASA. I had a, a gap in between where I went out into the real world. Yeah, we're going to talk about yeah, that, too. Yeah. But, I mean, go, so – and we're going to kind of break some of this down and talk about the evolution of communications in space. But let's talk about the very beginnings for you and this – the first things that you built – so I worked on a, a laser transmitter made from semiconductor lasers, which are the ones that are in your DVD players, right? Do we even use DVD players anymore? I don't think we have those, right? We're all MP3. and. But I think at least most yeah. people listening to this will know what a... Yes, thank yeah. you. Right. But it's the same lasers. Same little lasers, right. I mean, they're small and cheap, and, and you know that's one of the reasons that in the past LaserCom never took off because it wasn't small or cheap. And so that's kind of been where I've been pulling the program the last, you know few years I've been into it and to make it cost effective instead of just a, a neat thing to do. But that was the first thing that I built was a, a laser transmitter back then. Uh, I was a young engineer out, maybe 25, something like that, 26 at the time. And then the program got canceled. <laughs> uh, I knocked some stuff over and water went everywhere. No, kidding. And <laughs> shorted out the whole thing. And yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be a funny story. But I, I seem to remember... And, and again, maybe, maybe I'm remembering this wrong. That you were you you had also told me at some point back in those days that you were even helping like airplanes figure out yes. how to uh, detect in advance turbulence. Well, so that was a, a that that's what the the wind lidar stuff can do. So okay. if you can shoot a laser beam out in front of the airplane, right? And then you hit the molecule molecules of the atmosphere, and some of that light bounces back towards you, and if those molecules are moving, then you get something called the Doppler shift. And I'm not sure if a lot of folks are familiar with what the Doppler shift is, but it's when a train goes by and the pitch of the train goes, right? That's the Doppler shift or cars going by. So you can measure that on light as well. And you can measure the speed of the air in front of you, the wind blowing in front of you, or if it's you know turbulence going up and down, like a micro microburst or something like that by measuring the laser light scattering off the, the air molecules in front of you. So I never got it to the point of airplanes, but other people did after that. I built a little system using these little diode lasers again to measure wind out to a few kilometers from on the ground. But folks did eventually get systems you could put on an airplane. Now, another thing I may have told you that I worked on then was an ice detection system also for the wing of airplanes. And that's because if ice builds up 
on the wing of an airplane and you shine a laser beam on it, the light that reflects back, the polarization's changed because ice is on there. So you could look for that and see. And the polarization is what you get with sunglasses, you know. Sure. Want to help save the planet? Here's an idea. Go nude. Unfortunately, not wearing clothes isn't realistic for most of us. But buying sustainable clothing is. Here's Gordon Seabury, CEO of Toad Co. Few know the garment production can generate tremendous pollution. So that's why we're hellbent on offering cleaner, sustainably made clothing that's stylish and long-lasting. But that's only half the battle at Toad Co. When it comes to hitting our business goals, we've learned to focus on what we're good at and seek partners for other areas of expertise. So when it came to ensuring a consistent customer experience across all sales channels and knowing what was going on with all aspects of our business, we chose NetSuite by Oracle. They know business systems. We know eco-friendly clothes. A perfect match. From accounting and finance to commerce and human resources, NetSuite is the number one business system to help you simply manage your business. Right now, go to netsuite.com slash toad to get your free guide, Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. That's netsuite.com slash toad for your free guide. And to hear Gordon bear all on Toad & Co.'s growth story. So lasers. Yes. Clearly that was your thing. Yeah, that's right. Why? Because they're really cool. <laughs> sharks, you know, sharks and lasers and all that other kind of stuff. No, it was a, it was a neat field, and it's, uh, it's a nascent field. And, and right now for COM, for what we're doing for communications, I think it's going to be revolutionary. Right now, all the communications in space so far have been done with radio waves. And if, you, if you've been following things in uh, the market, you know, 5G is coming along. Radio waves, you have, to, you have to get a spectrum license, a spectrum allocation. If I want to use radio at a certain frequency, I need to make sure that I'm not interfering with anyone else that's on that same frequency. And so we all go off to the FCC and we negotiate, right? And we say, okay, I get this band, you get that band, and the, the military gets this band, and these are the commercial bands for this. And out here is 5G right by the way and that's another place with lasers you actually don't need spectrum regulation because they're so narrow and so hard to interfere with each other that that it's you know regulation in that way is not required and what i mean by that is you know we all we all have experiences with lasers everyone's played with a laser pointer right with a cat or something like that and it's this super narrow beam and so interference means... By the way, no animals were harmed during the recording of this podcast. I just want to make sure people hear. Okay, back to cats Chris and lasers. A, right. Chris has a house full of blind cats. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway um, the, the beam is so narrow and, and diverging that, that uh, it's really hard. You have to try, actually, to interfere with each other. Whereas radio waves go everywhere, right? I mean, we all know that. We drive in our car and we don't have you know, directional antennas and we all get radio. So uh, that does change a little bit as the frequency goes up in radio. Uh, so when you get to some of the higher frequencies where 5G will happen, for example, the beams are going to be much more directional, and you may have to point the beam from you know, the cell tower to, to a direction of where people's houses will be. But anyway, the point is, LaserCom will revolutionize a lot of that because that spectrum is so valuable. And you can look this up. I think in 2014, the government auctioned off some small fraction of Spectrum and raised $41 billion in the auction. And uh, so it's extremely uh, valuable technology. And, and LaserCom will get us past that. But it has downsides. So the Probably. biggest downside for free space LaserCom, laser communications, is clouds, right? So if I'm in space... And I want to I want to bring the beam down to the earth. If there's a cloud between me and the ground station, then I'm not going to be able to to get it through. The way we get around that, first of all, there is some penetration through clouds. We have a ground station in Hawaii right now on the top of Haleakala in Maui. There's a laser com ground station. It's basically a telescope uh, looking up at the sky. It's above most of the clouds, and we're measuring the weather up there. We've been doing it for the last couple of years, and Half the time that there's a cloud over top of you, it's penetratable by these systems, which means that you know we're good for you know 85, 90% of the time at the, that one site. There's still 10% of the time where there's a cloud over it. And so what we do there is we build a second site and we just go to that and it's called weather diversity. So the odds are better if you've got multiple sites. And again, this all goes back to cost because if you can drive the cost of these sites down, you can have more of them out there. Gotcha. <laughs> I want to talk about a couple other things in that early part of your career with NASA. 
you did some work with a laser illuminator for the space shuttle. Yeah, and yeah. back in the '90s. That's right. What was that about? So uh, this was actually one of these fun low cost projects, but uh, we had a satellite and we wanted to see if it could be uh, steered basically by how it was oriented in the atmosphere and with these magnetic torque rods torquing against the magnetic field of the Earth. So th we had a project to throw this satellite out of the, out of the uh, space shuttle, and then once it's out, you needed a, an instrument to be able to characterize it and see it, because it got far enough out that you couldn't actually see it with a camera or something like that. So again, we used a laser system to measure the orientation of it. and so. I uh, bought a commercial off the shelf, five watt laser, and we did shake and bake, you know, so to speak, to, to, to make sure that it would survive in space, packaged it up in fluid, and then used it as this big spotlight. And it's funny because we didn't have really a beam director on there, so when they wanted to point it, the shuttle astronauts actually had to adjust the entire space shuttle to, to point this That's thing around, funny. steer it around. <laughs> So you, had, you had, so you had to adjust for that sort of thing, for for jitter and different. You have to deal with all that. That's yeah. right. So the 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 latest systems that we have, like the system that we flew to the moon, and I was the mission manager on this mission called the Lunar Laser Communications Demonstration. Flew in 2013, and we demonstrated 622 megabits per second from the moon back to the Earth. That's a huge distance, 400,000 kilometers, and it's the equivalent of streaming 30 HD TV channels all at once, right? So for NASA, that's, that's a lot of data, right? And we also demonstrated 20 megabits per second up to the moon, which means we could stream HD TV to the moon as well. And this is important because when NASA goes to send humans to deeper space, and you have astronauts in space for a long time, their mental health is really gonna uh, depend on how connected they are to the Earth. So if they're getting live streaming video of their family, of uh, medical doctors, or you know, of, of even uh, mundane things like you know, watching Netflix or being able to see the Super Bowl, it will help with their psychological well-being not to be as isolated. So LaserCom, again, is the thing that allows you to be able to do these big, you know, upstreams actually away from the Earth and out to deep space. So that's one of the other reasons we're pushing it for our astronauts. Okay, so so let's get into that a little bit. So compare that up, up upstream, downstream speeds to what we're used to here on Earth. Compare, okay. So uh, if you've got Fios in your house right now like I do, I, I, uh, you know, I'm a Verizon customer in the D.C. area, and, and no plugs here, by the way. 75 megabits per second. <laughs> I'm a Charter Spectrum member. <laughs> so I just want to even it out a little bit. <laughs> That's right. Comcast is in there too somewhere. We just visited Comcast recently. They're awesome. But anyway, typically you get 100 megabits uh, to your router at home uh, on your cable, and your uplink speed is lower generally as well, right? And your downlink stream is much faster, speed sure. is much faster than your uplink for uh, similar reasons, right? So the reason that we're limited on the space side is because when I'm collecting that signal from the moon back to the Earth, I've got a much bigger, you know, telescope to catch all those photons versus, uh, you know, on the space side, I have a little telescope, so I can't catch as many photons. I see. I see. So that's what is receiving those signals on either end. Yes, that's right. They're telescopes. Gotcha. Just like what I grew up with. Well, and there was, in the early days when you were at NASA, it was the Hubble telescope. That's right. Is that, where is that now? Hubble is still working. Is it really? Oh, yeah, it's still taking fantastic pictures, but it hasn't been serviced in a while because when the space shuttle went away, we lost the ability to fly up to Hubble and send astronauts out to change out the gyros and put in new hardware and, and fix it up. So it's, uh, it's uh, gradually degrading, and at some point it will uh, start to fail, and uh, hopefully at that point we'll have the James Webb Space Telescope up. When is that set to go? Well, so I believe at this point it's scheduled to be launched in 2021. It was supposed to have gone, I think, this year, and they've had some issues, and so they had to move it. Big yeah. projects. Well, obviously, since the Hubble telescope is decades old now, right? Yeah. It, so what's new with a new one? Like what's so the aperture, bigger? The telescope is eight times bigger, right? And uh, it's cooled to, to 40 degrees above absolute zero. Right, which means that its detectors are much more sensitive. And so, for example, we're hoping that we can start to image in the infrared maybe some planets around other stars. Hmm. Exciting kind of stuff, right, if we can pull that off. So 
it's going to be beyond what we're seeing now with the current Hubble. Gotcha. I mean, no pun intended, right? <laughs> Well, so going back to you talked about the the twenty megabit per second up right. upstream link. One of the the big applications is mental health for our astronauts. What are some of the other applications of having this? I mean, obviously for the upstream, for, the uplink, the upstream. I mean, obviously the downstream is capturing the imagery and sending it down as fast as we That's can. Right. right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean, so remember what the videos look like when we watched Apollo. I mean, you and I are about the same age. I remember being, I remember being seven years old and my second grade teacher rolling the old TV in and all of us watching the, the last uh, landings that were, were done in 1972, but it was terrible video, right? I right. mean, just like grainy, terrible stuff. Uh, they you could know, have made it up. <laughs> they could have made it up. Exactly. That's right. They could have made it up. But, uh, you know, in this, this time here, when we go back to the moon, first of all, we're going to go back to stay. And then the second part is we're going to bring the American public with us with, you know, UHD type uh, of, of video uh, participation. And people will think that's probably made up because the video quality will be so good on our laser beam. So it'll be like, oh, you're doing it in a sound studio in Santa Monica. <laughs> it's like the uh, opposite side of, uh, of the equation. Right. So, so UHD quality video from Earth to space. That's right. That's right. So think about it this way. Uh, let's say you have to send instructions on how to do an appendectomy because someone all of a sudden has had their appendix burst in deep space, right? And maybe you don't have a doctor on board. Maybe you want to hide a UHD then there's video no MacGyver of how that works. Up there. That's right. <laughs> well, all the astronauts are MacGyver, that's right? True. That's but true. they need help on figuring out what to cut and what not to cut. So you can see sending an HD and a UHD video up of an instructional video of, of how to do surgery, right? For example. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then obviously real time communication with families. Exactly. Imagine. That's right. That's right. Now you always still have the delay from the speed of light. So from the Earth to the moon, it's one and a half seconds, right, or one and a quarter seconds, two and a half seconds round trip. When we start sending folks to Mars, you're going to have delays of 20 minutes, you know, up to 20 minutes, 23 minutes, and you're not going to be able to overcome that. Now, we do have uh, efforts that we're working on now called quantum communications, and that's where you take, you know, atoms or you take photons and you can entangle their states, and then if you pull them apart, when you make the measurement on one, the other one instantaneously, you know, changes with no time elapsed between the two. Now, that doesn't mean we can communicate instantaneously because you still need a classical, not a quantum, but a classical communications channel to be able to interpret the results that you do on the other side. But it does mean that we can use this quantum entanglement. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance, and he never believed it was true, but in the 70s, experiments demonstrated it was instantaneous. You can use that for time transfer. So for example, uh, the GPS satellites transfer time, right? They actually put a time pulse out. We get them here, but, but other folks who have better equipment, you know, you get it on your phone. You get the time, we're all getting the time pulse off the GPS satellites. But if you really want exquisite timing and you have the right equipment, you can actually do it, you know, three or four or five orders of magnitude better by this uh, quantum entanglement uh, technique. So it's, you know, it's really exciting stuff that we're doing. And you have to have laser comm to make that work because, you know, you got to be able to point a laser beam around because these quantum photo photons are sent in a laser beam, right? They're part of a laser beam. So then how do you enable that? I mean, is there, str is it just stronger lasers? Shorter distances? Gee, I'm trying not to get too technical on this, but you have to develop something called nonlinear optics. So it's like a two-photon process where uh, one photon goes in at a pump in this special crystal. And in this special crystal, two brother photons get generated, and those two are actually entangled. Right, and then those are the two that go off, and then you, one goes here and the other one goes to the other side of the universe, perhaps, or wherever you want to send it. And then when you make the measurement on one, instantaneously the other guy does its thing. So how far, how many years are we away from seeing the benefits of that? Well, uh, I will say that uh, benefits, that's a good question. I, probably a decade. And, and the other part about this is this is what's needed for networking of quantum computers. So I don't know if you've ever had anyone in that, that talks about quantum computers. If not, I can get you some, you know, refer you to some very interesting people that about quantum computing. Quantum computing is, is one of these things where instead of having ones or zeros for bits, 
the bits are actually all the possible states in between of these two because these things are entangled. So uh, the problem is, is you can only make com a quantum computers that are only worth, uh, you know, that can only support a few tens of qubits right now, right? So, so the data sets are too big? No, it's just really hard to maintain all this entanglement for a, a certain number of you know atoms or whatever it is you're entangling. And it all has to be done close to absolute zero, oh, right? Very cold temperature type stuff. So one of the things you do when that happens, what do we do now when, we, when, we, when our problems are too big for our individual computers? We do parallel computing, right? We break the problem up into 10 different computers or however many, and we network them together and we share the problem. So this quantum entanglement distribution that I'm talking about, this quantum networking, would allow you to, to be able to network quantum computers and they could be smaller. Quantum computers, by the way, can break any encryption that we have right now. So the day that those come online for real, they can do that. But the other thing they'll be great for, modeling drugs, you know, modeling all sorts of things. And there's a, a lot of uh, theorists and also uh, philosophers that, that say that our brains are actually quantum computers and that's why we can do things that silicon has just never been able to do. Hmm. If you've ever met a famous athlete at a corporate event or gotten an official autograph, chances are Steiner Sports made it happen. Here's Brandon Steiner. We believe that there's magic in the moments that sports creates. We get customers closer to the game and help companies use the power of sports to grow their business. We've been in business 30 years and we've had multiple systems to keep track of all the athletes and all of our customers. Multiple systems means multiple headaches. So we made the move to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite lets us replace all of our finance, inventory, and CRM functions with one convenient system. Now all the departments can see the same data. And if I have a question about our business, I can get the answer quickly. This month, NetSuite is offering a free 60-minute business review with an expert in your industry to identify opportunities to turbocharge your growth. To get your free review, go to netsuite.com slash steiner. That's netsuite.com slash steiner. netsuite.com slash steiner. Let's, let's take the uh, journey a little bit deeper now into... So you you mentioned Mars and you mentioned deep space. Yep. So what are what are we doing communications wise for Mars? Okay, so we have a project in my program called the Deep Space Optical Com program. It's run out of NASA JPL here in Pasadena. As a matter of fact, I'm going over to see those folks tomorrow. That's why I'm in the neighborhood. And uh, that mission is going to fly. Uh, that, that laser comm demonstration, it's much bigger than, than any of the terminals we've flown so far because it's going to go further in space. And it's flying on this spacecraft that's going to this asteroid called Psyche. Psyche and Psyche is in the asteroid belt, and we believe it is an all-metal asteroid, like the failed core of a planet like Krypton. Right. Maybe it's Superman's <laughs> Krypton. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So anyway, uh, and, and what we expect to see there is really cool, but this laser comm system is, is kind of riding along as a demonstration. And so that's, you know, we'd like to be able to bring even more data back from deeper space with this system. Now, the telescope that we're going to use for that on the ground, we're actually renting the 1940s Hale Telescope at Mount Palomar, which is between here and San Diego. Beautiful place, a beautiful uh, uh, a piece of uh, you know Art Deco architecture <laughs> from that period, the 30s and 40s. Right, it was part of the New Deal in a way when when it was started. But uh, it's a giant five meter telescope. Uh, the astronomers still get a lot of use out of it, even though it's 80 years old. We're going to rent it from Caltech, and we're going to use that as the ground receiver for this uh, deep space, ultra deep space experiment. What makes it ideal for this? I mean, it, it sounds like it's an anachronism. Uh, it's all about catching photons, right? Think it's, about photons from, from your signal like raindrops, right? The bigger the bucket I have, the bigger the diameter of the bucket, the more rain I catch, right? And that's what this game is about. It's like, how can I catch enough signal to then be able to decide that was a one, that was a zero, that was noise, right? You're trying to figure out it's all bits, right? Yeah. How many photons do I need per bit and how many do I have to catch? So, so this one's just big. It's just big. Yeah, it's big. And then there are bigger ones. So we actually have a really cool thing we're doing. You know, the current deep space network at NASA has these giant radio telescopes. There. Some of them are like 70 meters in diameter, the ones that we have in the, the DSN. 70 meters is almost a football field, 
right, in diameter. So think about a football field being mounted on this big giant mount that can be pointed exquisitely like, you know, to a dime at, you know, at 10 miles sort of thing. But what we're doing with that telescope, that RF telescope, radio telescope, is we're lining, starting to line the middle inside with, with mirrors so that we can make a bigger optical telescope inside that radio dish. And basically we just point all those mirrors to the same spot here and that's where the detector is the communications detector so again it's just catching photons and so so this is at what phase is this right now well we've built a few of the segments already and it's looking good so we're hoping to scale that up and we'd like to have that ready for this mission to the psyche asteroid the metal asteroid and that's going to be launched in 2022 which to me is tomorrow and NASA speak, that's tomorrow because launching in 22 means you work yourself six months back. That's when the spacecraft gets delivered to the rocket. And six months before that is when our payload, our instrument, gets stuck on the spacecraft. So it's right? got to be done at that point. We have to deliver it like in 2021, which is like two years from now. Right. right. So, yeah, we're up, we're up in the middle of it all right now. Everything's being built. Real how, hardware is being cut right now. How far is that away? Uh, the it, distance? The, the, yeah. Four astronomical units, also known as 93 million miles times four. So what is that? 360 million miles, 400 I'm million guy, miles. I'm the math guy. 400 million miles. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Way out there. Like it's four times the distance to the sun, between the Earth and the sun. So it's 38, 40 light minutes, something like that. That would be the delay. So what's the speed that we would communicate at? The speed of light. But radio does that now too. You always have that delay, even though there was some, you know, some some wish that this quantum thing would would make that instantaneous. But now we're always going to have a delay to deep space. The the furthest thing that NASA has in space right now that we talk to are the Voyagers. You probably remember that mm-hmm. Voyager one and Voyager mm-hmm. two. They are 19 light hours away. It takes 19 hours for their signal to get back to us, and they only deli- the data rate is now just like 100 bits per second. Oh, because they're so far out. Right. Yeah, and that's what I was referring to, like what's the data rate at yeah. those distances? So what we're doing for this deep space optical comm is 100 megabits per second. Okay. Woohoo! that's what I get at home. Yeah, well, that's pretty impressive still, though, Yeah. at that distance. I, I'm curious, too, does NASA now work with other countries? Absolutely, countries? absolutely. So this is, this is something that's not well known, but uh, we do cross support for communications. So when a NASA satellite is over Europe, we can dump data to a European ground station, radio ground station, or a Japanese radio ground station, and vice versa. So we call that cross support. And I believe that the most recent assessment says that we do about $100 million of cost savings by doing cross support, meaning if we build, you know, if, if we can interoperate with, with the Europeans and the Japanese in space and they can do that for us, I don't have to build a ground station over there in their territory. I use theirs. I saved money, right? So we actually have a standards body that we get together twice a year to develop standards. We've been developing standards for LaserCom the last five years. I'm going to be going to Japan, as a matter of fact, at the end of next month to visit with my colleagues there. They are building a vibrant laser comm system as well. I'm going to tour NEC because they're building the, the laser comm modem for them. And we're going to go and talk standards as well. So, And I'm wondering, just getting back to Mars for a second, and, and so is a lot of the communication that's done now still radio-based? Yes, yes. Everything right now is radio-based. In a talk you gave, you talked about how, how we're missing moments because of the slow communication rate. Yeah. What do you, what do you mean? Like, so what do you think we're missing? We uh, don't know? or I mean, what's Well, no, actually, so, so I remember what that's in reference to. So, for example, we've had spacecraft around Mars for decades taking pictures, but because the data rate from Mars is so low, I think we've only mapped in detail maybe 10% of the surface of Mars. So what are we missing? What have we not seen, right? What, what is some interesting thing like water pouring out of the side of uh, one of the cliffs, which we've recently seen. I don't know if you've seen that or not. There's actually flowing water on the surface yeah. of Mars, right? Yeah. Cool stuff. So, you know, there's a lot more of that that we're missing because we, we're leaving a lot of data on the table at these places in space. Do you, do you think that, I mean, you mentioned humans going to Mars. 
I still think of that as like so far fetched. But like, is 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 having more data and understanding it one of the keys to unlocking that? Absolutely, absolutely. So if if we're going to the moon or Mars. Uh, one of the things you have to learn to do is live off the land. Remember that uh, there were two expeditions to the South Pole, you know, in the early part of last century. And there was the British expedition, and they brought a whole lot of things with them. They had a tractor that needed gasoline and all these other things, right? And that was not a successful mission. They got to the pole, but they didn't make it back because they brought all their supplies with them. But the Norwegians were the ones that got there first, and they all survived getting back. And it's because they lived off the land, which unfortunately included eating their dogs. I don't know if you knew that, but that's how they did. It's very sad. It is very sad. And no dogs were harmed in this either. But <laughs> We did not eat dogs. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but so, so where I'm going, I'm sorry, I, I, I kind of left that open, but, but, but we want the same thing uh, if we're going to the moon or Mars. So the big thing about going back to the moon, you know, you've heard the plans. It's been announced that we're going to put boots on the moon again in 2024. We're going to the South Pole of the moon. And the reason is, is because there are these craters at the South Pole of the moon that have been shaded from the sun for billions of years. So as comets have come in and bombarded the surface of the moon, comets are basically nothing but snowballs. That's all they are. The water has basically blown up and then settled back down in these permanently shaded craters. And measurements from the 90s actually indicate that there's like several yards full of water in some of these craters, like frozen ice water down at the bottom. So if you can mine water on the moon, you can turn it into oxygen and breathe it, and you can turn it into hydrogen and fly back with it. So that was my point about living off the land, right? If I have to bring all the fuel with me to the moon to get back, and all the water and, and oxygen I need to live there, then it's it's not practical. If I can mine locally, then you could do that. And that's why, again, you know, the data is so important because if we can find where the water is, same thing for Mars. If you can find out where the liquid water is on Mars and be able to mine that, then you could practically live there because you got to live off the land. So do you think humans on Mars is possible in our lifetime? I think Elon Musk is going to give it his best shot, no doubt. I think it's possible, sure. I mean, it, it could be done if you're properly motivated and you're willing to take risks, right? It's kind of how we started out the yeah. Conversation. So I mean, yeah. I mean, let's talk about that. I mean, obviously NASA has its own things that it's doing, but a lot of the space exploration has been privatized, and companies like SpaceX, of course, companies like Amazon are interested in it as well. But like these companies are playing by new rules, right? They ha they're not tied to as you call them the checklists of the past, right? So that gives them an advantage. That's true, and that's and it's. A, there was a book a few years back by Tom Peters, I think, called Creative Destruction or something like that, and and it and it talked about how you know new companies or new new players will always have that advantage. I mean, you know, I think that the newer space agencies around the Earth, you know, the national space agencies are also experiencing that as well, right? So I mean, you've, for example, the the, the Chinese have a pretty active space program and they don't have the experience but on the other hand they don't you know they they don't have the legacy pullback of it either so it's you know it's 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 probably a fine balance right you want to have experience but you don't want to be burdened too much by that experience besides the the sort of esoteric you know they're they're not bound by old rules what do you see SpaceX doing that is unique and and exciting well, so they realized about the economics of space. I mean, think about what we've done for the last 70 years when it comes to rockets. It's the equivalent of buying a, a 737 jet, filling it up, flying to where you're going, and then throwing it away at the end, right, destroying it. And so they realized, hey, let's make this thing completely reusable, right? And so they've come up with a system where you launch it. It comes back down, it lands. You've probably seen those videos. They're as awesome as anything, the landing rockets. Yeah. And th the trick is how much refurbishment do you have to do between flights, right? Because the space shuttle was actually reusable. Those were flown again. But there was a lot of you know costly refurbishment because of the tiles and things like that that would come off. So I think SpaceX is, is showing that they can make that work. I know that they just launched 60 satellites a couple nights ago. I don't know if you saw that or not. Yeah. But that but that was a, that's a whole other business unit for them. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that, that they want to provide internet. Yes. For us on Earth. Yes. Right? And, and Low I, latency internet. That's right, right. From LEO instead of GEO, from low Earth orbit. Right. right. 
that's that's and they hope that that business when they populate all that will generate the money that they can go to Mars on. Right. You probably heard that. Yeah. So I think Elon Musk said something like, you know, the 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 space expo- exploration business would project out to be like a three billion dollar a year business, but the the satellites and providing internet service would mm-hmm. be like a thirty billion dollar business. But as you said, would fund space exploration. That's right. That's it. They've done a lot of innovative things. Did you see their satellites, the picture? I did. They, so they have the rocket, and, the, and they, they literally are flat satellites like iPhones, and they have 30 and 30 of them stacked up. And there's this awesome video, if you want to check it out, where when they released them, and you just kind of see them all floating away from each other, and, and they l- naturally let them float away, and then they started turning on their system. And then I saw just an, uh, a night ago that uh, an amateur astronomer had looked up in the sky and videoed, and you could see this string of these 60 little lights in the sky going over. This is the naked eye, it's not telescope. Naked eye, so wow. we can all go out one night, you know, right after sunset, and actually see these guys uh, flying over. Now, they, they have filed with the FCC to fly thousands, 4,000, I believe. I, I thought I read, too, though, that they, they don't have the lasers. That's right, they don't this time. That's right. They they'd like to, but they don't have them this time, and it's a it's a it's a challenging technology to be cost effective, right? And that's I think that their price points are different than ours, right? So we can build exquisite systems for the government that are one of. They have to get to a price point that's you know probably a few hundred k or something like that per terminal. I wanna I wanna just jump back real quick to. There was kind of, you started your career at NASA, and then now you're at NASA. I don't want to say it's the end. You're still very right. young. But there's a middle part where you went off into private industry. That's right. That's um, right. I was part of the bubble. Yeah. Corvus, I think, was one of the... That's right. So Corvus is a company that was actually founded by the the founder of Sienna, if, if anyone knows who Sienna is. It's it was a, another like communications yeah, so infrastructure we were, company. We were a hardware provider, and we developed a system called Dense Wavelength Division Multiplexing. Basically, it's, it's a mouthful, but what it means is that you can take a, a single strand of this optical fiber, which is you know a long strand of glass, and you can shove in many channels where each one is a different color, right? And so that had actually been done by the company beforehand. And this is what powers the internet right now. This is like every day now. I mean, all the everything we're doing right now is, is being powered by this internet backbone between the cities going through these glass optical fibers. What we did is actually made an all optical system where you didn't have to stop every now and then and electrically you know, clean it up. You could actually send it from coast to coast, all optical without having to change, including switches. And so that was a very, uh, probably one of the most exciting jobs I ever had because first of all, it was a startup. I was one of the early employees. And I started in fall of 1998. We had our IPO in July of 2000. At, the, at our peak in uh, January of 2001, we had 1,700 employees, mm-hmm. uh, including 800 in a factory who were manufacturing product. Uh, it was a great experience for me. I started out in the research side. Uh, I got there actually not working on the prime product, but the second product. And it turns out that the prime product uh, didn't progress very well with its customer. We were aiming for Sprint at that time. So the product we actually wound up selling was the one that, that I developed with some other guys, right, with us. And, of course, the core people were all involved, too, in case any of them are on the, you know, listening. <laughs> but. But what was cool about that is I developed that, and then because it was this startup, all hands on deck sort of thing, meaning, you know what, if you need to scrub the floors, you scrub the floors, because we're in a startup, and if this pans out, we're all going to be loaded, right? I mean, you just, there's no, it it really was a great equalizer for personalities, and there was no empire building, none of that stuff, because we all knew where we were going, and everybody, you know, pick it up. So... After we did, after I did the research stuff with uh, the the guys I worked with there, we actually then worked to transition it to manufacturing. So I worked in manufacturing for a while and trained technicians because you got to teach people how to build hundreds of these things, right? And then from that, I actually went to the field and was the sales engineer, customer service uh, engineer, so to speak doing the field trials, getting the customers, the first customers to actually install the stuff. And when they had problems, I I remember this, the very first system we turned up, we turned up the network management system, right? We have a network ops center and knock like any big network does. And we had a million alarms in the system. And it's because, by the way, (laughs) it's not good. No. (laughs) And the the CEO of the company called our CEO and he's like, if you guys don't straighten this out right now and clean all this stuff up, then we're going to pull your gear out of here, you know, root and stem. So, 
uh, again, I was part of a team, led a team up, and we went down to the customer, and we just kind of plowed right through it, and we, we would knock off a few hundred thousand <laughs> a day by, by setting thresholds, right? It was one of these things that had been overlooked, right? And so a part of it is, how do you bring product to market where it's actually practical and you don't need a bunch of PhDs to run it? And at the end, the end of the story, aside from the financial part of it, was that our systems were installed in two nationwide networks and they ran for 15 years before they were pulled out. Now, the company didn't last that long, but the equipment kept living. It was like zombie wow. equipment, right? Oh, the, wow. Yeah. So then, you know, kind of bring it back full circle. Why, so why did you go back to NASA? So Corvus wrapped up in 2006 and I worked at a uh, another company that was a, a space contractor at the time. We also did speed cameras, but I'm not gonna talk too much about that. And then in 2011, I got the opportunity to be the, the manager of this uh, LADI mission, this Lunar Laser Com mission. And it was already fairly far along. They had had some issues, right? And so they had asked if I could come in and, and help to guide them through that process. And so it was it was a great thing to do. I mean, I went back, got to jump in with a great team. I worked with MIT, Lincoln Laboratory. They built the, the, the main hardware. They're just amazingly talented people. I love finding that, you know, this these centers of excellence. Very successful. The mission was perfect. We had honestly no issues during the mission. And then we won a bunch of awards afterwards, right? So we, we got the Nelson P. Jackson Award from the National Space Club. We got one of the breakthrough awards for popular mechanics. Gosh, we almost won the Collier Trophy, which is for air, airplanes, but we're not an airplane, so an airplane won it. Wow. But uh, anyway. Let's end with like, like what, what do we have to look forward to in the next five to 10 years? I'll give you two answers. All right. Okay, so first I'll focus on space communications. These, these constellations of low Earth orbit satellites, they're gonna get up. You know, they tried in the 90s. There were some companies like Iridium that did that. Iridium is still used. I don't know if you're familiar with that system, the Iridium constellation. Generally, what happened was they went bankrupt, but the satellites were still in the sky, and the folks who bought them out of bankruptcy for pennies on the dollar wound up, you know, getting access to those assets. And so they do provide a service today from that. I'm excited because these constellations will go up and you will see low latency and you will see ubiquitous bandwidth everywhere on the planet, including places like Africa. You know, if you're in Antarctica, you will get bandwidth. That's not something that happens right now. I mean, you can go on vacation in rural Maine and, you know, maybe you want this. I did when I went up there. My <laughs> cell phone didn't work. It was like, yes. But anyway, <laughs> you know, that's that's going to go away one day. Maybe that's the downside to that because people are going to be able to get you anywhere you are on this <laughs> on this globe. As far as space itself, I'm really excited about humans actually going back to the moon. Uh, we're going to do it internationally. I think that you know the Europeans are going to be part of it. They're already part of our lunar gateway that we're building that's going to be like a little space station around the moon. We're definitely going to land in the South Pole crater. We're going to mine there. We're going to do useful things, it's not just going to be flags and footprints. I think that's going to be an interesting thing, an inspirational thing, right? And do you, do you get to interact with like Bill Nye and... Oh yeah, I've met him a couple times. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, he's 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 as cool as he is, and you know, on TV in person. Is he? He's not as cool as you are in person, well, but yeah. Well, and I don't know, like, and I just want to end this by saying, <clears throat> like, hopefully you can hear this in Don's voice. But if you if you were here, we're, the, the magic of the podcast, you can't see the person. But you know, after all these years, the the gleam in your eye talking about this is amazing. Like you're still so nerded out and excited about this stuff <laughs> which is great to see so thank you for all of your uh, contributions and um, thank you for joining us thank you wow 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 so many exciting things to look forward to from our friends over at nasa including more trips to the moon maybe some podcasts on the moon i also hear they're doing marriages on the moon Really? Like they're bringing people up to be the first like couples married on the moon. Hmm. Very exciting. I feel like we're going to have a list of firsts on the moon. I know. We look forward to seeing any of that, all of that, whatever is next. So thank you so much to Don Cornwell for joining us on this episode of the Grow Wire podcast. I also want to thank our editors over at Lampstand, our producer, Kendall Fisher. Thank you, Kendall. Thanks for having me. And all of our listeners for tuning in. Don't forget to rate review, and subscribe. Talk to you soon.
You just listened to the Grow Wire podcast with host Fritz Nelson. Make sure to keep tuning in for more episodes full of tips, tools, stories, and strategies to help take your personal and professional growth to the next level. Until next time.